Welcome everyone, I'm Valerie Gao from the BEAT Advisory, and I'm so pleased to be introducing Eisen Architecture tonight and founding partner, uh, founding principal, Brenda Eisen. Thank you, Brenda, for opening up your studio and uh, to everyone for attending this in-person event. So I became familiar with Eisen Architecture through their Ontario Wood Pavilion IDS in 2019. I was so impressed that their dynamic and interactive pavilion was built with standard lumber. And they created a beautiful space for gathering and community and I really wanted to find out more about them. Uh, so hopefully Brenda will be talking about that project tonight. Um, Eisen Architecture specializes in the design of single family homes with a portfolio of projects distinctive for their finely tuned detailing. The all-female firm was founded by Brenda in 2015 and now comprises nine incredible women, many of who are here tonight, uh, who work collaboratively in an environment to enhance the quality of people's lives through good design. Eisen's ethos is that the quality of their architecture is evaluated by how it affects the lives of its inhabitants. They strive to create sanctuaries that promote wellness in mind and body, achieved through unique floor plans, and they they're coalesce with both natural light and uh, artificial light. Fresh air and air quality, the surrounding environment, proportion, color, and texture. They develop unique personal relationships with their clients and incorporate them as collaborators through the process. Eisen believes that establishing an open relationship with clients is one of the best ways to set up a project for success. So a bit more about Brenda. She received her Master's of Architecture from Cornell in 2008, where she was awarded the Alpha Roy Chi Medal upon graduation. She's a member of the OAA and RAIC and a supporter of BEAT. Brenda is deeply committed to helping lead the next generation of architects through a more equitable future, actively mentoring women through the OAA internship program and leading an all-female architecture firm to continue to break barriers and create new opportunities for equity. And with that, I'll pass it over to Brenda. Okay, hi everybody. This is so nice. Thank you, Valerie, for that wonderful, beautiful introduction. Um, I'm so honored to be speaking to the BEAT community and even more excited that we're back in person. Um, so welcome to our office, or more specifically, our service elevator lobby, which is outside our 1,000 square foot office where we have um, eight, a team of eight women. And you guys will have a chance to come into our office later and have share some refreshments with us and a little bit more networking. Um, I unfortunately am not going to be talking about the IDS Pavilion tonight, but maybe you can save that for the Q&A. And I did not realize that was um, your first introduction to us, so I'd love to get more into that later. Um, okay, so the point of what I want to talk about tonight is to let you all know what Eisen Architecture is about and what we're trying to build here as a team. Um, architecture, our architecture, is really an intangible. When our clients decide to hire us and pay us, the final drawing set that they get, which is the culmination of all of the municipal approvals packages, the building permit set, pricing set, construction set, all the reviewed shop drawings, the RFIs, details clarified, iterated, reiterated on site in the office, everything, these drawings are a small percentage of what they're actually paying us for. Our clients are paying us for our relationships. The relationships that, create, that we create with them, the clients, and the relationships that we've created with others in the industry are our unique value. I've built this business on relationships. Creating and maintaining these relationships is part of why we have been successful, and it's a big part of why we have an all-female team, which I'll talk about later. Our unique value comes from the quality of these relationships, and these relationships lead to customer service or client satisfaction, which is something that we don't always talk about in this industry. And I think that a lot of people in this industry might find these terms to be irrelevant to what we do. Um, for us, this starts from the minute a potential client reaches out to us. We start with an initial phone call, um, you know, to find out that they do, in fact, want to build a house, need an architect, want something modern. Um, and then we have a three-step initiation process before we even do a fee proposal. This stage is so important to establish the fit, communication, and trust. 
and to demonstrate to the clients how process-driven we are from the onset. So the first of these three steps is our, it's what we call our look and feel meeting. And so we will take, we'll pull together a bunch of images that we have either from our portfolio, um, images we've saved from, you know, publications or over time looking at beautiful, you know, details or spaces. And they are uniquely catered to this particular client. We're not, we're not showing the same images in every one of these look and feel meetings. If somebody calls and says they have a property on a ravine or they want to do an addition or, you know, whatever we talk about in the first call, we're catering these images. And this is one of the meetings that we used to do um, in person. We actually used to print out all the images, cut them out um, to little four inch squares, put them all across this table and the clients would come and we would make different piles and we would prioritize them in order. This meeting has been transformed for the better by our new virtual world. It is always now virtual and it's always gonna be virtual. And we put together a presentation virtually, digitally, we meet them on Zoom and we go, you know, category by category. We look at uh, landscape and bathrooms and we talk about, you know, how the spaces look and how they feel. Um, I want somebody to tell me, you know, instead of me getting to know them by a description, which they might think is useful to us, I love opening a picture of the kitchen and right away, you know, one of the clients is like, oh, I hate concrete floors. Like, I would never have that in my house. And then, you know, the other person is like, well, I like those pendants, you know, and you can kind of start to put together the building blocks of what will eventually be the project from these notes from our look and feel. The second meeting that we have is our wish list meeting. And this is where the relationships really come into play. This is the third time that we're meeting with our potential clients. Um, if somebody's calling because they want a five bedroom, six bathroom house, um, we're not gonna be the cheapest option for them. And if that's how they're approaching the project, we probably aren't the best fit for them either. During this meeting, we try to create a really casual conversation and a safe place for them to tell us things that they, you know, the, how they use their space. So we like to hear if they like to eat dinner on the couch or watch TV in bed, or if they have kids in competitive hockey that need their stinky stuff aired out every night. Um, or some of the more wild re requests we've received, such as an armory, a growing room, or a hidden sex den with a reinforced ceiling. <laughs> you know, we wanna, we wanna know actually how they're using their house. And if they can share with us how they really use their space, then we can design a properly customized, unique home that reflects how they live. It's better designed because of this relationship and because of this safe place that we're creating with them and what we're trying to build with them. Um, our third meeting is our process meeting, where we explain all the stages of the municipal approvals process, all the consultants that might be required for the project, how coordination works between us and the consultants, who's the point person, what are our stages in the project, our drawing sets and issuances, and then how we work with the builders and the trades um, during construction. Sometimes these potential clients have already received you know, advice from a builder, maybe bad advice, maybe good advice, or they've spoken with a neighbor about how much their builder grade house cost them three years ago. Um, and so we approach this meeting assuming that they know nothing at all and that, or that their information is incorrect. And we go through everything step by step and outline what they can expect from us at each stage and also our expectations of them. Um, and after this third meeting, we put together our fee proposal for this project only if it's a good fit for both us and them, and only if we're confident that we've built, you know, the starting pieces of a relationship that we will be able to build on moving forward. I don't charge the clients for this process. I have learned over time that it's actually more expensive to take on the wrong project than to invest a little bit of time in establishing the right fit. Um, not everybody is open to developing a personal relationship with their architect, um, but in my experience, a project isn't set up for success without this foundation. Um, residential projects are stressful for the clients. It's emotional. It's typically the most amount of money they've ever spent on anything. Um, most of the time they're borrowing this money, it's not even theirs, and they're watching the interest rates grow up. And construction is an inexact science, no matter how much planning goes into the project. So it's this trust that really helps us later on in the project. Um, in our office, we have four talented project managers, and they each lead a handful of projects. 
Um, they are on this team because of their intelligence, skill, motivation, and ability to multitask, but also for their ability to develop their own relationships with the clients and have the clients love them and trust them as much as they trust me, or ideally, and in most cases what ends up happening, happening trust the project lead more than they trust me, which is the ideal situation. Every time we grow the firm or interview for a position, I do consider all applicants equally. Um, but being expressive is a required skill in this office, and women are proven to be more expressive than men, and the applicants that come to me, I'm, I'm seeing that more in, in how I'm building my team with the females. Being able to understand design experientially is a required skill to work here, and women are proven to experience a greater range of emotions and to experience more intense positive emotions. That means we, as women, experience design differently and in turn, we design differently. Listening skills are also really important and also the ability to create an emotional connection. We over communicate. I over, I'm notoriously guilty for over communicating all the time and we care more about the houses that we're designing than any of the other stakeholders, and sometimes that's including the client that's gonna live in the house when it's done. Um, it's for these reasons that women might be drawn to architecture in the first place, the experiential moments of design. I think the latest numbers are something like 60 to 65% of students in architecture schools are women, depending on which study you reference. But we also know that this number gets lower the higher up you look along the path. I don't think this has to do with as much outright sexism and discrimination as it once did. The women ahead of us put in hard, hard work to pave this road for us, and I've been fortunate to experience real sexism only a handful of times in my career. I hope that your experiences are similar to mine. Um, I didn't have trouble getting into architecture school or getting a job or becoming licensed or even starting a practice because I'm a woman. I believe I'm part of a first generation of women to walk a completely clear-cut path and I don't want to minimize the struggles, the protests, the activism, the constant defeat that these incredible women put in for us. I'm, I'm truly grateful. The problem is that this industry is still designed for men. The hours, the deadlines, the networking, the overall lifestyle make it easier for men to succeed and advance than women. Having an all-female team, actually just running a business with any females on your team, comes with the responsibility to create a work environment that's both conducive to being productive, but also to being a woman. And what does that mean here? If I'm gonna fill this space with women in their 20s and their 30s, then a very big reality of their lives is going to be engagements and weddings and honeymoons and pregnancy and navigating motherhood. And in almost all of these cases, those things are a bigger deal to the women on my team than work, or at least while they're going through it. And it's my responsibility as an employer of females, as an employer of humans, to make space for people's lives and allow them to grow professionally while being women. Within my extended social circle, I don't know many people that chose being a full-time mom over being a professional because they wanted to. The ones that left work felt like they had to, either because the cost of childcare exceeded the, cost, the income that they were getting, or because they prioritized being present at something like a 3 p.m. pickup every day, which wasn't conducive to the demands of their jobs. And for somebody that defines themselves by what they create professionally, I feel that that's really tragic. I'm gonna give you a couple of examples of how we are trying to better weave work with life on our team. And to my team, I'm sorry that I'm talking about all of you, but I feel that our real life examples are the best ones. Mariah, one of our project managers, had a baby in October. She's been working 100% remotely since February, when she can. This is literally the second time we've seen her since she had a baby. I get most emails from her between 6 to 7.30 a.m. every day because that's what works best for her. I trust her implicitly, and she hasn't missed a beat. She replies to all client emails within 24 hours. She hasn't missed a single deadline. We went to the interior design show this year as a team, and Mariah said she couldn't come with us because of childcare. So I told her to bring the baby. We walked around the trade show floor alternating pushing the stroller and even alternated holding the baby during the lectures that we attended, and 
she has a baby at a beat talk. <laughs> Most of my team has opted for flexible hours at one point or another, and the option is always open to them. Another example is that Jordan, another one of our project man managers, went to Mexico this past January with her relatively new boyfriend for a month. <laughs> for a month, they both worked remotely during the day, every day, but then they were able to go for after work walks on the beach and drinks, focusing on their relationship and each other, while the rest of us commuted home in all of the giant snowstorms. <laughs> Ina, our interior design lead, um, has only come into the office for two days a week, ever, since way before the pandemic. Her lifestyle is more conducive to working at home and working her own hours, and she works better that way, and we, we book in-person meetings and site visits around her availability for the projects in which she's involved. And I'm a hockey mom. During spring hockey, which is now, it's April, May, and June, I work from the rink every Friday. Don't get me wrong, you all know that this is an all-encompassing job with frequent 70-hour work weeks, and we are dedicated, and we meet all of our aggressive deadlines, and we do it with the best of them. But there's more than one way to do this. Women should have it all. We should not have to assimilate to the schedules of a male-dominated industry, and I feel fortunate to have been given the platform and resources to empower my team of women and allow them to succeed within a different landscape. The other thing that I've observed and that we talk about in the office all the time, when we're talking about women in architecture, the successful female architects that you think about that come to mind are not typically overtly feminine. There's something about being taken seriously and the culture of wearing black that results in these androgynous public figures. I don't know what it is, but it's almost like they think caring about things like shoes or things that are considered feminine make them seem silly or less serious. I love showing my feminine side all the time, but especially on site. My brand is red lipstick and heels. The higher, the better. Um, it's feminine and sexy, but also so powerful. I am five foot eight in flats. And there's nothing I love more than towering over a site super and telling them what they have to redo, <laughs> or like mansplaining a waterproof detail to them and telling them why it needs to be done the way we've drawn it and not the way they've always done it. In the same way that I would dress up for client presentation or committee of adjustment hearing, I know that I'm an expert in this field and it's important for me to look my best. And that means for me to embrace my femininity when I'm exerting my influence and expertise on our own job sites. Being feminine in architecture is different from being female in architecture. We all know Zaha's famous quote, I'm not a female architect, I'm an architect. And that's definitely how I want to be credited for my work publicly, but I sure as shit am going to celebrate being female together with my success in this industry. Um, are there any waters? Thank you. Success is often attributed to experience and to the knowledge that comes from this experience. But if you have a strong network of people and good relationships, the collective knowledge base of that group also becomes your knowledge. Architects are often expected to have this encyclopedic knowledge and be experts in business, design, zoning, the building code, structure, building science, construction, and communication. Thank you so much. But there isn't one individual person that exists that has all of this knowledge and experience and expertise. Part of the goal of putting together a team is to assemble all of these different areas of expertise in-house. But I also have an army of people that I consult throughout every stage of the project, and I don't mean paid consultants. I call my architect friends to talk about fees, and what the municipality and approvals process is like if it's in an area where we haven't worked before. I speak with my builder friends to find out who has worked in a particular neighborhood, to find out what the neighbors are like, if they know anything about soil conditions. And I call my friends in the individual trades all the time to weigh in on design decisions, like whether a brick mason knows how to best conceal a brick lintel, or whether there's a way to integrate a window with a specific stair design that we have in mind. But you don't see those things when I'm talking on Instagram or when I'm, publications are quoting me as Brenda Eisen architect and not giving full credit to the entire team. I know some stuff, but like anything else, it's such a collaborative job. We're doing a project right now in Prince Edward County, and it's going to be a passive house, certified house. 
Um, we haven't worked in that exact part of the province before, and we haven't done a passive house yet to completion. But other architect friends of mine have done both, and I'm relying heavily on them for resources and information. Everybody has their colleagues that they rely on and exchange information with. And I'm there when those same friends need something from me, or even when it's somebody that hasn't helped me in the past. My network is super valuable to me and to my clients. My hourly rate reflects my experience and my knowledge, but also the value of my network. There's often times when I'm not the expert. Sometimes I'm with a client and they say, what do you think are the chances of the city allowing us to cut down this tree or, or saving this tree? And I'll say, I'm not an expert in trees, but let me call the arborist that I have on my speed dial and he'll know the answer right away. Sometimes saying, I'll get you that answer or let me check with somebody on that is the better, more credible answer. This to me is one of the biggest joys of growing up in this profession as much as I have and also of the, ret the return of in-person events. A lot of the people that I went to school with or the people that I started out with, they've done their own thing and they've become experts in that particular lane. The more you grow in this profession, your network grows with you too and you can add to that network. This profession is so rich with these types of interactions and the number of other professions that are intertwined with ours. And I'm so grateful for that. We are always, always learning and teaching. Um, one of the things I've tried to do with my Instagram platform is to try to make the inner workings of our profession better known and, and our day-to-day, -to, -day, to try and make our day-to-day -day life something that people should know. It's crazy when people first call us and they don't know the difference in offerings from one architect to another. They don't know that certain architects specialize in certain building types or you know, even why the fees have this insane range because they think an architect is an architect. And so that's something that I've been working really hard to change with our social media for the past four years. Um, okay, I also wanna talk about some of the work. I'm gonna share two projects, two of our projects with you today. Um, they're actually both renovation projects, and before we get into the images, I want to explain a couple of the things about the way that we approach our projects. So firstly, all of our projects are collaborative in the office. As I mentioned, I have four project leads, and they each run their own projects. They are the primary person, the primary point person for the client, for the city, for the builder, and the trades. I'm on every project team as well and then we cycle other team members into the project as necessary. So our clients have a team of anywhere between two to four people. We make all of our decisions together as a team, small or big. Today we had a two hour meeting with me, Jordan and Ina to go through mill workshop drawings and talk about the pulls for every single space, whether it's a finger pull, whether it's an integrated pull, what color is it, like just the pulls for two hours. It really enhances the project quality to have more minds at the table no matter how small the decision. And we even get to the level of like editing each other's emails to make sure that all the communications to the same client are consistent and are you know, on brand with what the relationship that we've built with the clients. Um, for these two projects, the other thing I want to communicate is about as, as the project team, we established two parallel thesis, theses for each project that become the core and the driving force of each project. We have one architectural thesis and one client thesis. And these two become intertwined in the design development and we run every single decision through these two theses. Um, the first project I'm gonna share, I don't know how I'm gonna do this. Okay, I'll put, the, I'll put up in a second. The first project I'm gonna share is House 37. This is a renovation to a typical home in Witchwood Park. But what's not typical about this home is that it's situated at a T intersection so that from the house, you can see down the street all the way to the Witchwood Barns. And also in front of the house, there's a spectacular 45 foot tall tree that I forget its species. What is it? Catalpa, thank you, Abby. It's a 45 foot tall spectacular catalpa tree. These two points, the T intersection connection to the park and the tree, form the basis for our architectural thesis for this house. Um, we really wanted to build a relationship with the house and the tree, which I'm gonna show you when we go through the images. The client thesis is that these particular clients are avid cyclists. They are always walking around the house in Lycra, making smoothies, storing their bikes, buying bike parts, walking in and out of the house with bikes, 
and they live a very particular lifestyle for which they needed a custom architectural solution. So this is the uh, site of the house for house 37. It's the one with the star. So you can see the T intersection that you can see from inside the house when you're facing outwards. And the green at the top is the Witchwood Barns is the park. So you can see the connection between the house and the park. Um, on this particular street, all of the houses were almost exactly the same. Um, our, the house that we renovated is the one with the red door. And we really wanted to be respectful of the vernacular architecture of the street. We didn't want to completely transform this house into something you know, that would insult the characteristics of the neighborhood. And so we intentionally kept a lot of um, the red brick and the roof line in the front and a lot of the form of the house. But then we also wanted to make a really dramatic intervention and indicate um, you know, the extent to which we had torn apart the inside and, and added to the back. So this is the house um, before, and you can see that's the spectacular tree in front. And this is a real estate photo, so I think they took it off center so that you could see more of the house, but it really interacts with the tree in such an impactful way. Um, so this is the ground floor plan of the house. The front door is on the right. Um, and so the first thing that, that we thought of with the tree is its verticality and how it just, you know, you see the tree and you automatically look up it, you want to go up. And so the obvious thing was to put the staircase at the front of this house and have the vertical circulation of the house interact with the tree. Um, the other thing that came with this was we put this massive oversized window with the staircase with the same proportion of the tree. I don't want to go to the next picture because I don't know which one it is, but you'll see in a second, um, to kind of mimic the tree in the architecture. And, okay, this is the stair. So you can kind of see the window. I know what's next. So this is the view from the stair, from upstairs looking down the stair. And you can see the way that the window frames the tree from the inside. We also have a big frame around this window on the outside that frames the tree in the same way. Um, and what's really special about having this moment every time you go up and down the stairs, which you know is like 30 times a day, is that you're, you're constantly interacting with the natural environment and the season and the time of day. And that's all so, so much a part of your circulation through the house. And so this tree is so different. I'm you know, still in touch with this client. We became friends, we've stayed in touch. And every time it's like, there's a snowstorm or there's a beautiful fall day or whatever it is, I'm always messaging them to send me pictures of either this view or the one from inside to post on the inter Instagram because it's just such a profound natural moment. The other incredible thing is that at night, um, when it's dark inside the house and all the street lights are on and the other houses and the light pollution, the tree is silhouetted in this view from the window, which is sort of that like inverse, really interesting um, play with the tree. Um, and then this is a view of the stair from the side. So you come up it from the front foyer and, and then you begin your interaction with the tree that happens on both levels. Um, this is the front foyer when you come in. It's extra deep, it's actually 36 inches deep instead of 24 for coats. Um, and when it's closed, when the front door is there on the right, it's black and, and it's all paneled and it just looks like this could be a wall, a wall treatment in the foyer, but it actually is filled with all this storage for their biking stuff and their biking shoes and their biking spandex and it's very convenient for them because they use different types of bikes in different types of weather. I, I paid attention a little bit. Anyways, they have different bikes. So they can, they can use this storage with its close proximity to the outside, and these are not inexpensive bikes, so they have to be inside the house. And so this whole foyer um, is actually bike storage, but it's done in a way that is residential and you know doesn't seem weird. Um, at the back of the house, I'm going to go back to the plan for a second. So where the dash line is um, across, I wish I could... Point, um, through the kitchen island, I guess. That was the original, um, sorry, the, you can, see, I'm gonna zoom. Okay, you can see this double uh, gray line that goes through like the CHE of kitchen. That's the original footprint of the house. So that's the original back. So we actually bumped it out to the side um, by 42 inches and then we put basically a cube um, it was like 25 by 20 feet on the back of the house. So it's a wider space, it's open, it allows for this really like open flow 
um, and interaction through the space. And then across the back of the house, we have these big windows that bring in light. Um, and they also, you know, they have the cross breeze with the front of the house, really big, wide, comfortable spaces that wouldn't have otherwise been possible in the house before they renovated it. This is a view from the back um, of the house. So you can see that's the ground floors looking back into that um, family room that I just showed. And we also contrasted, we went from red brick and changed it to gray along the sides. And we wanted, um, it's sort of like an ombre of renovation where the front is the most original and the back is the most new and everything kind of gradually goes throughout. Um, on the upstairs also, it's all windows. So on one side you have the bathroom and on one side you have the window. And interesting ane anecdote about our client, which is one of the things they were comfortable telling us um, in one of the first meetings, is that they shower together at the end of every day. They have like really busy lives. They have kids, they work, they do all the things. And at the end of every day before bed, they like recap and plan their next day in the shower together. And you know, when we were trying to come up with the requirements, we were like, do you need a bench? Is this like a sexy thing? Like, can you tell us more? But no, it's like literally business. They get in there, like one's on one side, one's on the other side. They're washing their hair. Like who's doing drop off tomorrow? Like, did you have that meeting? How did it go? Um, and so we tried to create a bathroom in this like really big oversized shower. It's hard to tell the scale because the way the photo is taken, but it's like for them to comfortably have these meetings. Um, and then this is the bedroom. So you have the bathroom on one side and the bedroom and they both um, face the back. And I don't, you can probably see half. So in the bathroom you can see, I'm gonna zoom. I like doing this on my phone. You can see there's a garage uh, out the back yard and you can also see it kind of through the bedroom. So that's gonna be phase two of the project and we're gonna turn that into like an entertaining space. And we just replaced the doors and, and painted it gray for now, but it's gonna be um, something that we're gonna be working on to integrate with the house. And then this is the front of the house. This is the after. Um, so you can see we have this really dramatic frame around the window that makes it feel the same proportions as the tree trunk and has that frame when you're looking down the street, you know, kind of hugs the tree, which you can also see from the inside. And then the other intervention that we have is this big canopy, which was both um, a little bit about the tree and a little bit about the biking, but we kind of played with the structure and have the asymmetrical columns. So there's only columns on one side and the canopy actually like hangs from them instead of being supported on them in the similar way that like the leaves would hang from the tree. Um, and you know, it reaches out into the street. They sometimes keep their bikes under here for a short period of time. So the dimensions were all sort of determined by that. And this is the view at night um, of that same house. Okay, the next house, going back to my notes now. Um, so the second project I'm gonna share is house 21, which is also renovation. Um, this was a renovation to a typical mid-century modern home in the upper Forest Hill Village. And for this house, we considered it to be a mid-century restoration more than a renovation. We wanted to go deep into the architectural history, the architectural principles, and some of the original materials of the house and bring this back with a new vigor and a new program for the clients. For this house, the clients are both doctors um, working in some of the most extreme high stress conditions. And we wanted to create a place for them that also felt like safe and clean uh, when they return home. So those were the, the two theses that we wove together for this project. So this was the house before. Um, as you can see, it's like a beautiful mid-century modern house. Um, and so we took a lot of the original elements. We really studied you know, how the house was constructed, both exterior and interior, and they had a lot of use of walnut, mixed materials, certain shapes and forms, and so all of those kind of come back together in the kitchen, which is really the heart of this home. Um, so this is a picture of the kitchen. And then this is another view of the kitchen um, towards the other angle, and we have this wall here that looks kind of, you know, very seamless and very integrated, but it's all a series of like hidden doors and portals which connect to the rest of the house. So on the left, you've got this like slat portal that's both a privacy wall and the entrance to the powder room. On the right, you have um, a door to a walk through pantry. So it's actually like a, a fully functional pantry. And then on the other end, you can see the natural light. There's a door to the outside, which is where they have their barbecue and their outdoor dining. So when they're making um, 
outdoor dinner, they go through this space. Um, and then there's also a hidden office nook um, inside this wall as well. One of the things that we really wanted to do was repurpose as much as we could from the old house, but in a modern way. So this was the original kitchen of the house. Um, it was in a slightly different location in the floor plan, but they had these knobs, I'm zooming again, um, that were original to the kitchen. And so we had all of the knobs refinished. We saved them throughout the entire construction. And then we reinstalled those original knobs on all the millwork um, to try and bring back some of the character of, of that time of the architecture. Another example of that, oh, I'll tell you another example of that in a second. So this is um, the family room is connected to the kitchen. And in the kitchen, we have this like exposed brick wall here, which was one of the original structural walls of the house. Um, you know, we took off the drywall and exposed the brick and wanted to um, keep this as part of the character. And then on the other side, uh-oh. Okay, hold on. Technical difficulties. Oh, it's my kids. Okay. Nope. Okay, great. I'm going to wing it. So on the other side of that wall, we have the fireplace area, which is, maybe it just froze. Yeah, hold on while I go through all my folders. Jordan, where is it saved? I found it. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, I'm back. Okay, so we have the exposed brick wall, and on the other side, we have this really clean and polished fireplace uh, where we used a stone that we actually took inspiration from some of the original flooring of the house. And so we have this book um, shelf, which is the transition point between the family room and the kitchen. And it's like a really, um, it's sort of one of the details in this project where we're bringing together so many elements and transitioning between different themes and different time periods. Um, I mean, there's so many moments like this in this project where we spent like a painstaking amount of time on the shop drawings because between the stone fabricator and the mill worker and um, whoever else had to be coordinated for this, you know, that all of the, the certain materials would sit proud of the other ones and that the, even though one is stone and one is brick and one is wood, that the um, kick detail and the filler piece detail were all of the same um, proportion and, and scale and everything. So this is like not the hero shot that's ever been used in the project, but for me, this is one of the hero shots. And then this is the other side of that wall. So you have, this is the big family room. You have that stone inspired from the original floor tile, the walnut again, and then beyond, you can see that the plane of where the TV is connects into that slat wall. That's the, the privacy wall and the powder room. Um, another example of how we repurposed something from the original house. So this is one of the real estate photos from the home and they had this um, walnut circle decorative screen in between the family room and the dining room. Um, and we also took it and had it refinished and stored it throughout the project. And then this is, it actually looks like a screen again, but this is actually the front hall mirror. So if you see the sconces on either side, like it's actually a wall, and then that's a glass mirror and the screen is put on top of it. So this is the mirror when they see when they come home, we've turned it into a very decorative um, mirror in the entry. And, and so there's like, moments like this throughout the entire house where it's like just it's different but it's still very modern but it's preserving a lot of the original house and then you can actually see here they had an inlay like a terrazzo inlay from the original house that we kept um, this border from from the original so there's moments like that as well um, and then this is the powder room same type of thing um, with the coordination and the trades trying to line up this uh, CB2 mirror, which was totally inexpensive and just had this like random line through where one side is totally opaque and the rest is reflective mirror with the wallpaper and tile installer and the mirror hanger to make sure that that line was, um, you know, totally flush and looked, you know, very intentional. And I think that's the case throughout. So this is on the other side of that slat wall. And then this door, which I don't think we have a photo of it, um, it's a flush door, so when it's closed and you're in that tunnel, you don't actually perceive that there's um, a powder room. There's actually no hardware on it because it's a push door, so um, that was fun. And then I think this is the last photo, but this is the um, this is their like den slash office, and there was an original fireplace. So the only thing in this image that's the original to this house is the brick on the fireplace. The whole fireplace was brick like this. Um, and we kind of took it apart. We found there was a structural column in there 
and then we reclad it with um, sintered stone that's the same color as the brick, so to create like a new sort of a meeting of, of old meets new, and the stairs there are, are done in that same sintered stone, and this is, um, um, and then we have the slat motif there that's also in the kitchen and also in the hallway. Oh, this is the last picture. So this is the exterior of the house again, and on the front exterior, we actually didn't do any dramatic interventions. This, it was important for us to keep the house um, sort of subtle from this side and consistent with the rest of the neighborhood. But something that we did was replace um, the front entry with materials that you see when you go inside the house. So it's setting your expectations for the home. Again, it's something a little bit different. Like if you know what you're looking for and you drive by, you see this slab on the outside, this walnut door, it's, it's inconsistent with what's going on in the neighborhood, but it's totally um, foreshadowing what's going on on the inside. And it's just, it complements um, what's there on the rest of the house. And that is the last one. Okay. So um, I've touched a little bit about how hands-on we are throughout the entire project. Um, which stems from our relationships with the clients, builders, and the other partners, but we stay really, really involved through construction and until after construction. Frequently, in addition to the furniture and the soft goods um, packages, we also help our clients with accessories and art. Um, ultimately, we're creating a space that is uniquely designed for their family and their lifestyle in an impactful way. Being able to work on projects that are transformative to people's lives is really fulfilling. There are so many milestones in a project, so many times when it gets a new life, when we present the plans to the client for the first time, when they sign off on the schematic design and it's a house, when the building is framed and you can actually walk through, when it's drywalled. These are all like, I always say, I go to site and I'm like, oh, this is my favorite part of the project. Like every part is my favorite. When you take your shoes off, like the first walkthrough when all the finishes are in and they make you take your shoes off at the door, like I'm so excited by all of them. But the real life of a building really begins when we as architects are done. That's when it takes its own life with its inhabitants and it starts to change their lives. And it's another new relationship. I love keeping in touch with our clients we become friends with most of our clients and I love hearing about the ways that the design has enhanced their lives. And those of our clients that have gotten to know me really well, um, they'll reach out and they'll tell me, like we had a client, uh, she just hosted Passover for the first time for her entire family since the pandemic in her new house. And she sent me a picture of her like fully set table. Like one of, one of the design goals was to have a table big enough to host her family. And she knew that would be so meaningful to me to see her hosting table and to know that her family's coming over in the space that we created. And that's all part of our learning process too, which I think a lot of architects forget. It goes back to the listening, the learning, and how this informs our design and alters our tuition. Like the user experience should be teaching us as much as anything else that we're learning along the way. For me, again, these are qualities typically associated with being a woman and how those qualities enrich our work and our way of being. And that's the end. <laughs>
you know, was really lucky to have a team established as I was building a family. I think that's the, the biggest thing is that I can lean on my team whenever I need them. When I'm not in the office, they are. And we communicate so frequently that, that everything, everyone just kind of covers for each other as things are happening, as people are away, as people are having different life moments. And that, that extends to myself as well. Like I don't always need to be here, which is really helpful. Um, I have to figure it out you know, to do it in other times, but there are most of the things don't urgently need to be done by me, which is great. Um, I, I'll mention a little bit about what we were talking before. I, with my daughter, who's my third born, um, I didn't take very much time off. I had her and I, I said to myself, I'm not going to even open my phone. Like I'm not even going to check emails for three weeks. And I didn't. And everyone who was here was amazing. And, and things just kept happening and I didn't know about them, which was so terrifying for me, but also like no houses fell down and no clients fired us and like it was actually great. And then after three weeks, I thought, you know, I'm gonna start working like twice a week, I'll ease back into it. And then as soon as I just like answered that first email or picked up that first call, they were like, oh, Brenda, you're back. Like, here's the shop drawings, here's this. Like, it was just this big, you know, open floodgate and I did a lot of this, like I, you know, I, we didn't have video call, like, I mean, it existed, but we didn't do video calls back then. So I'd be on the phone, like nursing a baby, or I'd be running out of the office in the middle of the day because I forgot to bring my pump or like whatever it was. But I, I worked really hard to make it work. And I think I've set my kids up to understand that this is part of my, part of my life as much as the family is part of my life. And they, they come here too. And like our, we have some of our we have our eyes and minis series on instagram where we involve like our kids and in in what we're doing and in you know the creation of social media and bringing them to job sites and it's it's part of how they're growing up are there any questions Mm -hmm. I feel like my team would be better answering this than me. Um, like I review drawing sets, the important ones, and part of working collaboratively and having a project team is that, you know, I'm thinking of an example. I can't remember what project it was. I think it was Lynn Haven forget I said what, what street it's on like um Sophia had produced the drawing set and then for some reason Ina reviewed it before I reviewed it so there's there's often peer review um or somebody else is looking at something when we're working on the team it can be two people like I think when we were having that millwork drawing today and I was stressed out the millwork meeting about the handles and I was like you guys can do this without me you know so sometimes I micromanage about some things Okay, Kiana's saying I'm not, but like, I feel like I am, but I'm also really trusting about other things. I feel like I'm more picky about communication things and how we're portraying what's going on inside the office to the clients than, um, than the actual work because they're all so thorough and detail oriented that I know, I know what to expect when I review a drawing set. And also there's always another drawing set. Like if it's going in for building permit and I don't get to review it before it goes in, like we'll make those changes for the construction set. Like the city doesn't care about like the integrated, recessed, whatever, you know? I try. <laughs> Thanks, Gianna. <laughs> Yes, I am currently and have always been the only licensed architect here. And I'm the only one that'll ever stamp the drawings that leave this office. It's my name, it's my brand. Um, but the team is in various stages along the path to licensure.
I think a lot of it has to do with you know, goes back to the communication and the relationships that I was talking about earlier. Um, a lot of it is is the videos that we talk about on social media um, portraying our knowledge, making our knowledge accessible, making, you know, certain things about the process known, seeming approachable. Um, and I think just building on that as each project comes out having the having a narrative and having certain things that are important to us that we always come back to and always try and accentuate um you know as we're as we're putting out content or meeting new people or creating new relationships any other questions yeah Okay. Great question. First of all, thank you for coming here as a man and listening to my like all female centric talk. And I hope you weren't insulted by any of it. Um, it's it's how I feel. Um, but I appreciate you being here. So I actually come from uh, a family that has architects. Neither of my parents are architects, but I grew up. Uh, my grandfather was an architect, and two of my uncles um, are architects. One of my cousins is an architect. Um, and so we grew up um, as a very close family, a very large family, and part of growing up was going to visit job sites. And some of what I described I'm doing with my kids are things that I did as a child. And so I didn't want to go into architecture um, for a long time because I was like the one that was tapped to be the next architect. I was always good at math and I was always artistic and everyone's like, oh, it's, it's her, she's up. And so I tried to resist that and I tried to kind of have an, a separate path. And I think there were a few moments in time that led me here in my own way. Um, my family that's in architecture all did and do very different type of architecture from what we do here. Um, and I thought that's what architecture was. And I didn't understand for a very long time how big the definition of architecture is and, and how small a niche you can carve for yourself within that and how different it could be from somebody else's. And so I went on my own journey, tried to leave architecture twice and came back here because this is what I love to do. And this, it's the residential architecture and developing the relationships with the people that are going to be using the spaces and the way that the that the houses and the architecture enhances their lives. That's that what that's what fulfills me and what like gets me going every morning. We might have time for one more question. Is anybody? Okay. I have one more question. Yeah. I, I love the the house that you designed for the two bikers. Mm -hmm. um, I'm very envious because my husband's uh, avid cyclist, and we don't have that nice storage for bikes and lightroom and that kind of thing. But I was very curious about the close relationship with your clients and how how do you get to them to open up about things like showering together at the end of the day? <laughs> what is it that you, you do? And what, what is your process? Or can you talk a bit about that? I think it's maybe the number of touch points that we have with them. Um, you know, I try and not have all of our communication by email. We have very frequent meetings at the beginning. We ask questions, we listen, we try and learn the names and ages of their kids and, and you know, infuse our conversations with some personal details, you know, like how did so-and-so's hockey tournament go this weekend or, um, you know, are your kids home from camp or whatever it might be. And I think that um, listening and remembering helps them to open up with us and, and when they see that we actually do care um, these details you know come to the front a little easier um, and also sometimes it's not the thing that they say in the wish list meeting which is the third time we've ever met them sometimes it's during the reiterative process when we've started doing the interiors and we're already in for building permits and then they'll you know talk about how they I don't know always cater and don't I don't know that's something that comes up earlier I'm trying to think of an example of something 
that would come up, but maybe, you know, how they store a particular thing or, you know, a specific wish for well for them and that it's not, we're not trying to just get them out of here and just issue the drawing set. We're, we're iterating as we go and we're listening as we go, then they become part of that process too and they, they enjoy it, I hope. Yes. Sure. Why not? <laughs> okay. Well, thank you so much, Brenda and the Eisen team for organizing this. And it was such a great, um, wonderful talk. Great pictures of your projects. Uh, very empowering of um, of an all women firm. Um, on behalf of BEAT, we would like to thank every one of you for joining us in, for tonight's event. And um, just to keep in mind, you can sign up for our mailing list on the website um, to be notified about future events. And if you'd like to volunteer, you can also find a sign up form on the website. Um, I think we can head on to the back for some light refreshments and we also have a few copies of Ca the Canadian Architect up for grabs and uh, thank you. Have a great rest of your evening.